I'm a nonfiction storyteller. Oftentimes, I travel to hidden places to seek facts for my stories. Sometimes, I will find evidence in the writing on the wall. Sometimes, they are recorded in other types of material. But when I find them, they become voices from oblivion. In this episode, we are traveling back in time to recap my journey of making the documentary Bolina 52. The film premiered in 2009, but the process began long before. In the year 2000, I began searching for a Vietnamese boat people story that would describe the pain that many of us have gone through. I dug deep into my research and found the story of the Bo Linao 52. This story sparked my interest. At the same time, it worried me. I was about to explore the darkest horror that many of us fear to encounter. Then I found this television program. On the Navy ship, a captain who had earned a silver star and purple heart in Vietnam a 25-year veteran who would end up facing a court-martial, Captain Alex Balian. Al Balian? Who's that? Never heard of him. Those 110 refugees had never heard of Alex Balian either when they left Vietnam with their dreams of freedom. This footage was taken by sailors on board Captain Balian's ship and obtained by us from his defense lawyers. Today, the refugees who survived are living in a UN refugee camp in the Philippines. They told us that when they boarded their boat, they were expecting a seven-day journey to Malaysia. But on the third day, the engine failed. They rigged a crude sail using canvas from the boat, and the winds carried them eastward. But five days later, most of the food and water were gone. The refugee boat drifted on, with people dying daily and those alive so thirsty they drank seawater and their own urine. And in addition to the terror of starvation, there was another terror. A former South Vietnamese soldier named Min took control of the junk, seizing the remaining food and rainwater and beating the other refugees. But on the morning of their 17th day at sea, hope appeared in the form of the USS Dubuque, an amphibious transport. Navy ships are instructed to pick up boat people if the refugee boat isn't seaworthy. And Balian had rescued refugees in distress twice before. But Balian, speaking publicly for the first time, says this refugee boat looked different. He says he didn't know then about the tyranny of the soldier Min, but he felt it was too dangerous for his men to go on board. But that's not what Balian thinks, and so he makes his first key decision. He decides to alter his usual procedure and orders his executive officer, here riding out on the small inspection boat, not to board the refugee craft, but instead to conduct the investigation through a Vietnamese sailor from the Dubuque who accompanied him in the inspection boat. They were decisions that would change many lives. Hard to look at these ships and not think about yours? It really is. I belong at sea. That's my life. Among the specific charges against Balian is that he failed to render assistance to three Vietnamese who swam to the ship. The refugees were thrown life rings, but the Navy says Balian ordered his men to shake the swimmers off as they clung to the lines hanging from the ship. But in fact, there was one refugee who drowned near the junk, and the Navy charge says a lookout on the Dubuque reported it and implies Balian might have saved him. But Balian says another one of those tragic errors occurred. The lookout's report never got to him. And even so, he says, the man was too far away to have been saved. Nguyen Van Sang was swimming within sight of the drowning refugee. The Dubuque couldn't save that man because it was too far away from him. Meanwhile, the Vietnamese translator aboard the inspection boat was compounding the errors by scrambling fact after fact. 
He reported that the junk had been at sea only seven days, not 17. When a man died of starvation and was thrown overboard, it was mistakenly concluded that he had tried to swim and drowned. And perhaps most important, the translator misunderstood when the Vietnamese meant to say their engine was broken. He thought they were saying they had no engine at all. And since no one from the small inspection boat had boarded the junk, they never saw an engine. So Balian, back aboard the Dubuque, concluded that the sail must have worked to carry the boat this far. Balian gave the refugees food and water, enough for the seven days he calculated they needed to sail to land. He also gave them charts and maps which showed them the way to the Philippines. But Balian says what he didn't know then was that the Vietnamese interpreter was making a final fatal error. In an effort to reassure the Vietnamese refugees, the interpreter told them that another boat would pick them up in a couple of days, a promise that was not true. Then the Dubuque steamed away. In fact, it would be another two and a half weeks before Nguyen Van Sang and the junk's 51 other survivors were rescued by Filipino fishermen. After the Dubuque left, and because of the promise that they would be picked up in a couple of days, the refugees stayed in place and ate up all the food. Within days, the food was gone, and the terror began again. Din Tuang Hai said that on the junk's 31st day at sea, the soldiers who controlled the boat, led by Min, came looking for someone near death to kill for food. It was decided that someone was to be Hai's friend, Kwong. Kwong knew what will happen, and he came to talk to me. What will happen if they come for me tomorrow and I'm still alive, he asked. But you couldn't save him. I was too weak then. I couldn't do anything. Kwong was taken to the back of the boat and drowned, with the flesh to be distributed to the people aboard the junk. What did they do then with the bodies? They used a knife to cut it in pieces and then they boiled it in seawater. All of us were starving, so we had to eat something to save our lives. If we didn't eat human flesh, we would die. So you're saying all 52 people ate? All of the 52 people who were still alive ate the meat. In the next few days, three more would be killed. One, a 15-year-old girl. Another, Hai's 11-year-old cousin. Mean and his friends came to take my cousin away and he shouted, Hai, save me. But I was too weak. And then Mean told me, I will be next. But rescue came the next day. Hai was saved. Still, the survivors live with the horror of what they had to do to stay alive. That was hell. I don't want to be reminded anymore about that trip. Everyone involved has a burden to live with. I didn't feel that the victim's story was clearly told through these reports. That piqued my curiosity into what happened on that boat. How did the survivors feel? What stories could they tell me? So I went on a search for the Bolina 52 survivors to get their side of the story. We at Voices from Oblivion are working to document, preserve and exhibit these stories for public education about our history the history of the Vietnamese refugees. Please support our work by becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com forward slash voices from oblivion to make a contributions. As a patron, you will get the first dip of our video. Follow our social media site on Facebook for news and development. No matter how large or small, your contribution is important to us and the future generations. Thank you.